Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about a 20th century masterpiece among piano concertos. That is Michael Tippett's. I mean, how many people really know Tippett's Piano Concerto? But you should. It is a beautiful, beautiful work, a lyrical masterpiece. And the most wonderful thing about it is that it sounds more like Tippett than it does a piano concerto. I really like that. I mean, I love it when composers can, can bend a medium to represent their own personal language. And even their writing for the solo instrument, that's the mark of a major composer. Now, Tippett, uh, what were his, his years here? Um, 1905 to 1998 was one of the major composers of the 20th century to come out of the UK. Now, since his death, his music has just gone, meow. that's a normal thing. Most of the time, you know, when composers are alive and they have a publisher and they're promoting their stuff and, you know, they're, they're a visible living face, you can, you can do things for them. And soon after they die, the inevitable reaction sets in and they tend to get ignored. So only time will tell how much of Tippett's music will enter the repertoire or at least be highly regarded because his music is not easy. I don't mean it's difficult in a sort of harmonic dissonance way, although his later stuff his, his, you know, actually sort of his middle stuff was kind of thorny. It really got to be. But he always had in his, in his musical syntax a certain lyricism, a, a melodic abundance, a joy in rhythm. I mean, his music's very, very listenable. His operas are weird. <laughs> I mean, they're really weird, especially the last ones. You know, the, the ice break and and the last one, New World, or whatever it was called, about aliens and flying saucers. And, you know, he, they deal with, with issues of, of acceptance and social policy and homosexuality. And, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not easy pieces to take to, shall we say. But his first opera, The Midsummer Marriage, which is a sort of modern, you know, psychoanalytical gloss on Mozart's The Magic Flute, is an absolute masterpiece. And this piano concerto shares a similar language. All of Tippett's music embodies a sense of struggle. He's been often compared to sort of to Beethoven, although, you know, I mean, Beethoven is Beethoven. Sometimes that's inevitably not to Tippett's advantage. But what, what the two composers do share is this sense of, of, of fighting, fighting with the medium to try and extract the maximum or at least the appropriate expression to the work at hand. And Tippett's music always did that from the very beginning. His earlier music, which is quite tonal and, and easy to take from that point of view, from a harmonic point of view, has just as much a sense of struggle as his later music does. This is also true of a composer like Schoenberg. You know, one of the things I always said about Schoenberg is his tonal music is just as difficult as his atonal music because you feel you feel this sense of of fighting with the medium of music in order to get it to do what you want it to do. And that's what Tippett was kind of like as a composer. Now, this piano concerto is quite a remarkable piece because in it, he is trying to to express in his own way, to turn the piano into a songful and lyrical instrument, a, not a percussive instrument, not a, a sort of bravura virtuoso instrument, but one full of long singing lines, which is not exactly, exactly typical of the instrument's nature. And so as a result, it hasn't had a lot of, a lot of exponents there are a bunch of piano concertos like that that sort of fight the piano. To a certain extent, the Brahms piano concertos do. The Dvorak piano concerto, seriously, that's why its piano part was rewritten, because these things don't sound idiomatic to the instrument. Julius Katchen uh, refused to play this piano concerto. He said it was unplayable. It really is. It's a remarkable work. But if you do play it and you do master it, the rewards are immense. The, the sound world of this piece is similar to that 
in the midsummer marriage. That is, it has an extensive part, for example, for Celesta, which represented the magic music in the opera. And it does that here too. There are duets between Celesta and piano. And every time it comes in, something, something sort of enchanting happens. It's a fabulous use of the instrument as a, as a separate solo voice within the concerto. I think the best way to get a sense of just how remarkable the music is, is to, is to give it a couple examples for you to listen to, because fortunately there's a Naxos recording. Yay! It's not my favorite recording, I have to tell you straight out, but, but it's good enough that you will certainly be able to get the sense of it, particularly in the first movement. You know, one of the things about this piece is that it seems to be loosely based on Beethoven's fourth piano concerto, also a concerto that reveals the instrument's more lyrical qualities. And even to the point where, where Tippett does his own take on classical concerto form in the first movement. That is, there's a long orchestral ritornello before the solo actually comes in. And really, although it's all expanded in a sense, because there's a big prelude for orchestra and piano in which the piano sort of fills up the opening chords. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then the orchestra comes surging in and for the first four minutes, the piano doesn't play at all. It really is, it really is amazing when you consider that this was written in like the 1950s. A modern piano concerto, I mean, they weren't doing that then. Modern piano concertos, you know, the piano just comes banging in right at the beginning. But that's not Tippett's intention. So let's listen to the opening of this concerto and you'll hear just what a special and amazing piece of music it is. There's nothing like it, nothing like it in the entire piano literature. Here it is. Beautiful, isn't it? I mean, it's really, really beautiful music. And then I want to play you a little bit of the sort of cadenza-like passage at the end with the piano and the celesta sort of duetting amongst themselves. Again, another lovely, lovely moment. And then the orchestra comes in and the first movement ends quietly. Here's that passage. I think these two passages really sort of sum up what the 
piano concerto is all about. Now, one of the things that makes Tippett's music sort of difficult to assimilate is that you have beautifully consonant harmony right next to very, very dissonant harmony. Partly, this is a result of his music's contrapuntal rigor. You know, he doesn't really care in pursuing his independent contrapuntal lines how much they clash harmonically. And so and so something that sound, starts out very tuneful can wind up sounding extremely dissonant. The slow movement, for example, is strictly canonic and it has some really crunching moments, but they're all very, very logically worked out. The finale is rhythmically really tricky, extremely tricky with some brilliant virtuoso horn writing. It's really an exciting piece. And one of the fun things about it, quite frankly, is that it has only been recorded five times. So we can actually compare and talk about them very, very simply. I'm so happy sometimes when that happens, when there's only a, a limited number of recordings, which everybody can know, and the comparisons are clear, and you can pick the one you like, and you don't have to go through a stack of 400 of them. I really do wish it had been recorded actually more frequently because it deserves the attention. It deserves to be absorbed into the repertoire. One pianist who I saw play it, who has it in his, in his fingers, was Emmanuel Axe. And there was a rumor that he was going to record it for RCA, but apparently that never happened. It's such a pity. It really is, because I think it would have been a marvelous performance. But anyway, let's talk about the recordings. And then we, you can you know, pick the one that you like best, assuming it's still available. I mean, most of these you can sort of find somehow. <laughs> you can find them. All right, so the Naxos one here uh, features Benjamin Frith with the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra under George Hurst. It's coupled with the ritual dances from the Midsummer Marriage. Now, the problem with this recording, the first movement is beautiful. The next two are somewhat lethargic. They're just too slow. And and as a result, um, I, you know, if you don't know the work, you won't notice that it's sort of dragging or you may, you may be bored in the slow movement. I, I, I It's a shame. It really is because, you know, Frith is a very good pianist and it could have been better if they just pepped up the remainder of the concerto. But if you're stuck for choice, this still gives you a pretty good sense of what the music is about. And the ritual dances from the Midsummer Marriage are glorious, wonderful, wonderful music. Next, we have Howard Shelley with the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra on Chandos, conducted by Richard Hickox as part of the Chandos sort of tippet, tippet cycle of symphonies and other orchestral works. Now, this too is, I find it, a, a, a slightly droopy performance. I mean, not, again, in the first movement, which is quite good, but in the latter two. The tempi tend to be broad, but it's a, it's a beautiful performance. It really is. And you get with it his Fantasia on a theme of Handel, which was his other major work for piano and orchestra, and the Preludium for brass, bells, and percussion, and the Fantasia Concertante on a theme of Corelli for string orchestra, which was one of Tippett's most popular works. I find it to be actually kind of more difficult than the piano concerto, not because it isn't beautiful, it really is, but because of the the abundance of contrapuntal lines that all kind of, you know, get entangled with each other. That's part of his style. And you have to sort of just get used to it and accept it because he liked to have an abundance of very springy contrapuntal syncopated musical things all happening at once. And the result can sound cluttered. It really can if the performance isn't good. In a good performance, it comes off okay. This is a good performance, by the way. So the Chandos is worth considering, but also worth considering is, and here it is, Tippett's own version. This is with, uh, let's see who's doing this. It's it's Mar Martino Tirimo. Um, piano, and it's coupled with his triple concerto, which is a late work for violin, viola, cello, and orchestra in his thornier late style. I happen to like the triple concerto. I think it's a terrific piece, but it is, like I said, somewhat difficult. It's a little thorny, although the central section is gorgeous. It's a beautiful lyrical melody. And the piano concerto performance here is, again, it's broad in tempo, somewhat relaxed. Tippett's you know, recordings of his own music. And he was a very good conductor of his own music. He he actually studied conducting with Adrian Bolt. And and he, he knew how to conduct. He really did. But his his performances of his own music tend to be rather relaxed and expansive. And that's 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 okay. 
It's not as relaxed and expansive as the Naxos. And that's the point. So this one on Nimbus is worth considering. Let me see if I can get it without the glare. Now, well, maybe I'll take the booklet out. There we go. New booklet. There it is. It's lovely. So that's worth considering if you if you can still get it. I know it's still around. So uh, you might consider that one. But there are two other performances that are, I think, in the absolute superior class, if you can get your hands on them. The first was the first recording of the work, which is with Colin Davis and John Ogden. This is a great performance of the piece. This is the fastest performance of the piece. Um, it's very exciting. Um, John Ogden is in really good form. Colin Davis was sort of a Tippett specialist. He was Tippett's champion among conductors. It's in this uh, British music series on EMI. This is a two disc set. It's also available on a single disc. Um, those versions are all sort of out of printy, but they may be, you may be able to find them. You may be able to get them. But Colin Davis and John Ogden is, you know, was for so many years the first choice, and it really remains one of the two first choices. However, however, if we want to have a single version, uh, I mean, the absolute best version of the piano concerto, I think, that combines sort of a little bit of the more relaxed pose of the later versions with the tension and rhythmic thrust of the original version with Colin Davis and Ogden. I would, I, I just think this one is amazing. Stephen Osborne on Hyperion with Martin Brabens conducting the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra. Now this also comes, this is a two disc set though. That may be an issue for you because it also comes with the Fantasia on a theme of Handel and the four piano sonatas. Now, the piano sonatas, I think they're marvelous works. They, they, they cover Tippett's entire career. And so each one of them is, in a sense, a sort of capsule view of his various different stylistic predilections. They begin with the more lyrical and traditionally tonal first sonata. In the second sonata, he's moving towards a more thornier idiom that you hear in, for example, the opera you know, King Priam and starting in the second symphony. And then the third sonata is quite angular and thorny in his sort of central manner. And then his last sonata is a synthesis of all of those elements. He, he, he recaptured some of the lyricism of his earlier music and combined it with that sort of uh, block-like and more rigorous and, and, and harmonically truculent, I guess is the word, construction of his central period. And it's a, I think it's a masterpiece. I really do. I love his piano sonatas, but you may not. And you may think that's too much tippet. And you don't want to have too much tippet at first. So so my, my you know, I, it's up to you what you want to do. My suggestion would be to start with, with Colin Davis and John Ogden, if you can find it. If not, you can get Howard Shelley and Hickox. But if you really want the best one, I think you have to go with Stephen Osborne and Brabins on Hyperion and take the piano sonatas one at a time and let them soak in because there's so much marvelous music there. I'm really, really curious to see if in our lifetimes, Tippett starts to reestablish himself in the repertoire, not because he was around and because of politics or pressure, but because it's really great music that he wrote. I mean, he wrote some really stunningly great music. And I'm going to be talking about some of his other works as well. I'm really looking forward to doing that because they are beautiful and rewarding pieces, haunting pieces. Once you get into and accept his personal style. And the important thing to keep in mind is that he really did have a personal style at all periods of his life. He had a remarkably personal style. He didn't really publish anything until he was over 30. He disregarded a lot of his early work. He was very conscious of the fact that he needed to find his own voice. And he did. Whether that, of, that voice turns out to have universal appeal is one of those fascinating questions that always dogs us in the wonderful world of classical music. And we'll have to wait and see, won't we? In the meantime, do give the piano concerto a shot. Give it, give it a try. I think you'll really, really enjoy it. It has the most, the most magical is the word. I mean, moments. And it sounds like absolutely no other work of its type written this century. So keep on listening, folks. Thank you for joining me. Take care.